Now let's move on to airborne surveillance and early warning radars. Those radars with larger planes that do surveillance and tracking, Joint Stars, AWACS, and Hawkeye type of radars. And there are many other countries that build these different radars for their own um, military usage. Um, for airborne surveillance and tracking radars of the large ones that I mentioned before, performing the airborne early warning function, they have surveillance, tracking, and fire control modes. They do a lot of reconnaissance because uh, they're airborne assets above the earth and they do intelligence. And if examples of them are airborne early warning radars and radars that detect ground targets and track them on the ground. And they use as methods pulse Doppler radar, synthetic aperture radar, displaced face center antenna techniques, and other modes and techniques that are more advanced and evolving in this field. And the elevated platforms provide long-range, over-the-horizon coverage of airborne and ground-based targets. And here's here are photographs of several of the different platforms. Uh, Global Hawk, uh, a, a, a UAV, uh, has uh, radars and, and its payload. Uh, this radar system up here on a Boeing 737. We've talked a little bit about the E2C, the airborne radar that the fleet uses. It's aboard aircraft carriers. These wings fold up and it lands nicely on aircraft carriers. You've probably all seen the picture of a synthetic aperture image of the uh, Joint Stars uh, radar, the APY3, um, and here's the uh, antenna. And the AWACS, which has been gee, around for at least 35 years, yeah, about 35 years. And uh, of course, its radar has been upgraded different times. It's an S-band radar. We'll go over these, each of them in more detail. Now, first, let's look at the coverage issue. For a ground-based surveillance radar, here we've in a curved Earth. Here we've got marked off what generally is the kind of surveillance you get with that kind of a ground-based platform. And with an airborne surveillance radar, when you move the airplane up high, you, you for the same power aperture product, you're able to illuminate a much longer ranges and and that is the, the, the one of the key benefits of it. So elevating the radar can extend the radar coverage well out over the horizon. Uh, range coverage uh, in these radars is from oh approximately 400 to 800 kilometers, and ground-based radars it's 400 with an airborne radar it's not that hard to double your range to 800 kilometers distance. The issues with these radars are this, uh, pretty much the same as with all airborne systems. They have very high acquisition and operating costs because it's very hard to operate an aircraft 24-7. You have to have, you really need to keep one in the sky all the time. You need three aircraft. Uh, one that could be in maintenance and one that's just landed and the crew is resting and they're doing minor techniques to fill it up with uh, JP4 fuel and whatever and the other one that's up there in the sky doing its work. So there's ha cost is an issue. You've got limited antenna size so to, you, re you reach out and touch another aircraft or whatever it's, uh, ap aperture is a big issue. And the radar weight and prime power are also significant issues that where you have to generate that prime power um, and be able to have the power to carry the weight of a very high-powered radar. And it's a more challenging clutter environment. 
Uh, looking at the characteristics of ground clutter from an airborne platform, here we see an image of a of an E2C, and we see its radome. And I've just uh, uh, using Adobe Illustrator pointed out, uh, oh, just an image of a of an antenna beam, you know, and its first side lobes and then its back lobes. And this is what the Doppler frequency of that radar would look like out at the side. You'd have zero dop at looking at the ground, look, looking at the ground clutter characteristics. Looking at the ground, you'd have a big hit on the ground because there's no radio velocity at the very tip. And then, but there's a width to it. And then you're going to have side lobe clutter, as I've talked before because the side lobes are going to reach down to the ground because they're not all that far. And so there's going to be a width to the side lobe clutter. The side lobe clutter will reach out from twice the velocity of the platform over lambda to minus twice the velocity of the platform over lambda, depending upon where the side lobes are pointing. Okay, So you can calculate um, the entire side lobe plus main lobe coverage in the following manner. The frequency of the clutter we calculated earlier looking at the hyperbola was twice the velocity of the plane times the cosine, the, the, the direction cosine with, with the angle down you, that you're pointing down from the plane and uh, it's twice the velocity of the platform divided by lambda times cosine theta sine th phi. And then the Doppler frequency width is the sum of the side lobes and the main lobe beam. And so you can, and, the, and that becomes just the sum of these two numbers. And the Doppler frequency width of the main beam from null to null is just the the four VP over lambda times lambda over L the the length of the antenna. There's a step or two missing and you can look that up in uh, Skolnick's book if you're interested. Um, it, it's very interesting to note that when you have a beam and it's looking out at an angle theta, um, it's got an individual clutter scatterer, say at this red dot, a distance away, alpha from the main beam. And the beam width here is theta sub b. There's a, even though um, the, cl the clutter spectrum, the Doppler frequency of the, of the clutter return depends on the angle of the clutter with the velocity vector of the aircraft. And I've neglected the depression angle of the beam in this discussion. So it depends on the this angle and the angle of the clutter. Now the angle of the clutter is here so that we're going to get a spread in Doppler frequencies to the main beam. And the Doppler frequency of the clutter return at the center of the beam we calculated before at the center of the beam is just 2 VP divided by lambda times cosine theta and the Doppler spread of the main beam can be found by differentiating this equation. And the spread of the main beam clutter maximum at, zero, at theta equal to 90 degrees. So when theta is over here, even though at the center of the beam there's zero Doppler 
to the clutter because it's it, it's perpendicular the spread of the of it is maximum this next view graph shows you that effect in this case we're looking at an aircraft speed of 400 knots antenna beam width of uh, seven degrees and the angle between the ra uh, the radar beam and the platform velocity vector is theta a theta of zero we've got zero spread but remember the you've got zero spread only for zero but the but there's a beam width to it so there's going to be some when you're facing forward there's going to be in the beam there'll be some spread but very very little when you move the the angle between the radar beam and the platform velocity vector to 30 degrees you, have, and you get a 30 hertz spread and when you're 60 degrees you get 60 hertz and at 90 degrees you get 70 hertz both the width of the clutter spectra and its center frequency depend on theta and when the antenna points in the direction of the platform vector the Doppler shift of the clutter is maximum but the width of the spectrum is theoretically zero and when the the antenna is directed at the direction of perpendicular to the direction of the platform that's broadside the clutter center frequency is zero but the spread is maximum now you have a, an aliasing effect in uh, UHF low PRF radars which we've been talking about really and say for a PRF to 360 hertz it corresponds to a maximum unambiguous range of 225 miles a relatively large portion of the unambiguous Doppler space is occupied by the clutter spectrum because of the platform motion. Widening of the clutter needs to be reduced in order for standard clutter suppression techniques to be effective. So we're going to talk about techniques that we can use that, that, that are within the radar to narrow this clutter spectrum. There are two effects that can seriously degrade the performance of a radar on a moving platform. The first is a non-zero Doppler clutter shift, and the second is a widening of the clutter spectrum. And these can be compensated by two diff different techniques. Uh, one TACAR, Time Average Clutter Coherent Airborne Radar. It's an acronym, you know, TACAR. And... Um, and what you do is you basically change the center frequency of the radar to the out of the clutter spectrum. And it was developed uh, many, many years ago, um, actually by my first office mate <laughs> at Lincoln Laboratory, um, Mel uh, Labatt. He and some people at, I believe, NRL that had been working on it received uh, the um, I, IEEE's Pioneer Award. Uh, for developing this this technique to dealing with airborne clutter but as one can expect as technology continues uh, other techniques get developed and particularly with the, the uh, beginning of phased arrays that you could employ on aircraft uh, the so-called displaced phase center antenna concept was developed and tested and that that was also developed by uh, at Lincoln Laboratory, uh, the protogener of it uh, called the MASA program. I'm going to show you some results from it in a minute. And that dealt really with what the widening of the clutter spectrum when you're looking perpendicular, how you could see objects in that clutter spectrum that was very wide. And these techniques have been used uh, over the years to compensate for platform motion. And here's uh, the, the TACR. It's also called Clutter Lock MTI. 
And as I uh, alluded to, the Doppler frequency shift from the ground clutter can be compensated by using a clutter echo signal itself to set the frequency of the reference oscillator or the coherent uh, oscillator in the radar. And this process centers the, gr the ground clutter to zero Doppler frequency and then standard MTI notch filter techniques uh, attenuate the ground clutter. And this technique has been used in ground-based radars to mitigate to mitigate the effects of moving clutter, and uh, it's not it hasn't been used after the advent of uh, Doppler filter Doppler filter processing, and it's also been used I think mostly in airborne radars actually, and um, there are new advanced techniques that are in the works and as you can imagine uh, there's not an awful lot that can be said about a specific military uh, radar and uh, these are about the only things that can be said comfortably <laughs> in an open forum. Uh, there's a new um, mode, a new radar that is being e equipped onto the, uh, the Hawkeye that carries the airborne ra radar for the fleet and it's a new version, the E2D, and it has a mechanically rotating active electronically scanned array. And it uses the concept called space-time adaptive processing to do the processing optimally of the return signals. Uh, space-time adaptive processing is a concept that I may or may not give a lecture on, it'll be about a third of the lecture, but it would be just elementary, uh, an elementary um, explanation of the concept. It has a great deal been written in the literature. There are several books that have been written. Uh, probably the best reference is uh, uh, a project report by Jim Ward in the mid-90s. Uh, that's uh, unclassified. And then there's a book, um, uh, the, the, there are two books out there that just have the, uh, uh, one by Mark Davis and one by Clem from Germany. Uh, and also there's, uh, on this Proteus aircraft is a, this pod is a multi-platform radar insertion a technology insertion program which would be this radar is to prove the technology to upgrade the Joint Stars radar and Global Hawk and then wide area surveillance aircraft and uh, these are two advanced airborne electronic radar programs that are underway and it would have a it would give Joint Stars an even more advanced ground targeting capability. 